Father, we thank you that you've gathered us together here today. Lord, we ask that you speak to us through your word. This is an ancient word. This is a word that you spoke to your people many, many, many centuries ago. But Lord, it still applies to our day. So speak to us today through this word, Lord. And as always, we welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit here with us because we know that as the Holy Spirit is with us, there can be no spirit of distraction in the room. And as we know that the Holy Spirit is with us, there can be no spirit of doubt or confusion in the room. Only the Holy Spirit gets to speak and move and have his way. And Holy Spirit, we do long for you to do just that. Amen. Amen. So again, Exodus 23, 25, if you don't have your Bibles handy, they will be up on the screen. I want to look at just these two verses today in Exodus. Exodus 23, we're going to look at verses 25 and 26. And again, this is from a time long, long time ago, millennia ago, when the Lord was leading the Hebrew people through the wilderness. He was preparing them to live as a free people and no longer slaves. And that's kind of an important contextual historical fact we need to keep in mind here. They're, they're leaving slavery and they're coming into freedom. And so he's speaking to them in that context. But I believe that this is a real word and there's a lot of relevance here for our day today, okay? All right, let's read these two verses. Worship the Lord your God, and his blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. Thank you, Mark. These two verses are full of a lot of promise, and they should really get us excited, honestly. There's a lot of promise in there. Did you see that? Who wants blessing on their food? Anybody? Anybody? The Hebrew verb blessing, barak, is usually or almost always translated as blessing, but its root, the essence of this Hebrew verb, means to give life. Now, the Lord's blessing on your food does not mean that your chicken is going to come back to life, as my Hebrew professor used to joke. My Hebrew professor said, don't bless your food. You don't want your chicken coming back to life. Here in this context, I think we can see it as multiplication. Who would like to see that kind of blessing on their food? Amen. In, the, in the blessing of the Lord on our food, our food will go further. Yeah. We can handle that in our day and age, right? And then it says that he'll take away our sickness. Who wants to have their sickness taken away? Anybody? I know for a fact that there are people in this room right now who are sick. And you would love to see that sickness go away. And the Lord promises to take away the sickness. But wait, what's the catch, Tim? It seems too good to be true. Well, there's a little bit of a catch. At the beginning of this verse, there's a little phrase that we better pay attention to. See, we put up 25. Worship the Lord your God. That's the catch. <laughs> now, here in English, there are two words, Lord and God, right? In Hebrew, it's the names Yahweh and Elohim. Many consider the name Yahweh to be the proper or personal name of God. It's perhaps the most complex of all God's names, and yet it's the one that has the most basic use. The name Yahweh occurs 6,823 times in the Old Testament. And then the second name here, used here is Elohim. The name Elohim means first or creator. It's the very first name of God we see in Genesis 1.1. In Genesis 1-1, when it says God created, it's Elohim. Elohim means creator or first. Both names, Yahweh and Elohim, though, are strongly connected to God as creator. So it's no accident that these names are used here in this verse in Exodus. God calls us to worship him, but he's also calling us to remember that he is creator God. And he gives all those promises here of blessing our food, and taking away sickness, and he gives all those blessings in the context of saying, hey, I'm Elohim, I'm creator God. There is such a strong contrast here in the Hebrew between who God is calling them to worship and the other gods that we're going to see in a minute. The promises here, these promises that we just looked at and got it excited about, are rooted in the fact that God is creator God. Yahweh Elohim, Okay. Then there's this basic command to worship here as well. Now, the Hebrew verb can also mean to serve. Many English translations render this verse, serve the Lord your God. But the, word, the Hebrew word serve, worship, it's, they're very synonymous. But what God is really saying here is worship or serve me wholeheartedly and exclusively. 
And we're going to unpack this as we go. Well, why is God giving this command here in this place? Well, to understand this command and these promises, we need to go back a little bit and understand the context into which God is speaking this. So I want to go back to verse 23 for a minute, Stephen. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jezebites, the Mosquito Bites, and I will wipe them out. <laughs> Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. <laughs> As the Israelites were passing through those other nations, God was concerned that they would be tempted by their gods or be bitten by the mosquitoes. Remember, the Israelites are just coming out of captivity, and they're not used to freedom yet. So he gives them this command here to worship him, and then reminding him with the choice of names that he uses that he is creator God. So he's saying, hey, I'm creator God, worship me. And God is saying, worship me wholeheartedly and exclusively as you remember that I am creator God, and don't be tempted by those other gods because they are not creator God. They cannot bless your food or water, and they cannot take away sickness. Yeah. So that's the context. As they're passing through these other nations, and he knows that there's all these other gods out there, small g gods, God's saying, I'm creator God. You worship me wholeheartedly and exclusively, and I will do things that those gods cannot do. Yeah. And I would say, of course, that this is still a word for us in our day. We must worship the Lord, our God, wholeheartedly, and exclusively. And you might say, oh, but pastor, I do worship him wholeheartedly and exclusively. And if you were to say that, I would call your bluff. And in order to call your bluff, I would say, show me your calendar. I will look at how much time you spend on things. You see, to worship something means you give it your time and your attention. Right? So to worship something wholeheartedly and exclusively, that means I'm giving all of my time to it. So show me your calendar. Because remember, worship is about more than just singing songs on Sunday morning, right? So I can look at your Wednesday calendar and tell if you're worshiping God wholeheartedly and exclusively. Not just if you were here at church and raised your hands. So as I continue to call your bluff, I would point out this. A recent study found that the average smartphone user touches their phone 2,617 times a day. Let me say that number again, 2,617 times a day. But wait a minute, that sounds like enough time and attention to be considered worship. Ouch, is right. The average American spends 705 hours per year on social media. In contrast, you could read 338 books in the same amount of time at an average reading speed. Most people say, yeah, I just don't read that much. You know, I just don't have time. The amount of time you spend on social media, you could read 338 books. I got a few I could suggest if you're looking for a list. The average American spends 2,737 and a half hours per year watching TV. That kind of sounds like enough time and attention to be considered worship. This one really struck me. Shopping is now the number one leisure activity in America, usurping the place previously held by religion. And that study is from 1994. In 1994, shopping was the number one leisure activity of Americans, more so than any religious activity. Yeah. But again, that sounds like a form of worship. I could not find statistics on video game uses, but I'm sure it's up there. Many Americans now say that they're too busy to honor the Sabbath. But research has shown we get sick more when we don't honor the Sabbath. Wait, didn't the Lord mention that somewhere? <laughs> and I don't, by Sabbath, I don't just mean going to church. I mean true Sabbath, which is a form of worship. Yeah. 
We can only Sabbath when we are worshiping him wholeheartedly and exclusively. Otherwise, it's not Sabbath. It's binge watching or something. Many people say they're too busy to come to the prayer meeting. Well, then you're too busy. Let me see how much dust is on your Bible. Do you not have time to read the word? Catch this one. 37% of Americans never take a vacation. 37% of Americans never take a vacation. Even if their job allows vacation time, they don't use it. But here's the thing. The Hebrews had three week-long festivals a year. Three weeks of no work and a focus on God and worship. Three weeks out of the year where you don't do anything but worship God. Man, we need that in our day. I want to read you this quote from John Mark Comer. Anyone familiar with John Mark Comer? He's a, an amazing writer. He used to be a pastor and then had a higher calling. He says this, and he's citing some research here. Adjusting for population growth 10 times as many people in the Western nations today suffer from unipolar depression or unremitting bad feelings without a specific cause than did a half a century ago. Americans and Europeans have never had more of everything except happiness. Ten times more people today have depression than a century ago. The reason given for this is busyness, and I would say lack of Sabbath and true worship. Here's my point. We claim that we worship God wholeheartedly and exclusively, but the amount of time and attention we give to these other things seems to tell a different story, right? Have I made everyone in the room mad yet? I'm trying. <clears throat> but see, here's the thing. None of these things are bad per se. Cell phone use isn't necessarily bad. Watching TV isn't necessarily bad. But we must ask ourselves, how much time are we giving over to these things versus time with the Lord to be able to honestly say we're worshiping him wholeheartedly and exclusively. Yeah. Or often people will say, well, I'm just trying to make a living, earn a little money, and, and so we hustle about, right? But listen to the words of Psalm 39. Stephen, I think that one's in there. We are merely moving shadows, and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth, not knowing who will spend it. My dad died on the first day of his retirement. The very first day of my dad's retirement, he died. That's sobering. All of these other things we spend our time on prevent us from worshiping God wholeheartedly and exclusively, which is what God was trying to warn the Hebrew people about, right? But now if you tell me, oh, God, oh Pastor, I, I worship wholeheartedly and exclusively, and I continue to call your bluff, I would say, show me your checkbook. Oh, ouch, Pastor, now you're hitting below the belt. The average evangelical in America today gives 2.5%, despite God asking for 10%. The proportion of evangelical Protestants who gave money to the church fell to 61%. So just 61% of Christians are giving 2.5% to the church. I, in my personal experience, the 2.5% would be high. It's closer to 1%. <clears throat> Here's the thing. I think many people believe in 10% and they want to give 10%, but they misplace the decimal point and it becomes 1%. <laughs> Is it any wonder that the greater church, the capital C church, is struggling? Just this week, Amy and I heard reports of pastor friends of ours getting laid off. Church can't pay them anymore. But here's the thing. This is the what I want you to catch. Does giving 2.5% to the Lord sound like wholehearted and exclusive worship? Because I might ask you, well, how much do you spend on Starbucks? How much do you spend on Netflix? Statistically speaking, you are probably spending more money at Starbucks and Netflix than you give to the Lord. Again, these are averages and statistics, but many people give more time and money to their hobbies than they do the Lord. 
which is why I chose vegetable gardening as a hobby because it costs little and gives you a return. I get to eat tomatoes all year out of it. God calls us to worship him wholeheartedly and exclusively, but our calendars and our checkbooks are telling a different story. So what do we do? Just like God didn't want the Israelites to get distracted by the gods of the nations, God does not want us distracted by the temptations of the small g gods of our day. We must ask ourselves, how much time are we giving to those other things versus the Lord? We need to be honest with ourselves and do the math. How much time are we giving to the Lord and how much money are we giving to the Lord? Actually do the math. I was really impressed. Last week, one of the leaders in our church came to me and said, Tim, I did the math and realized that we were way off on our tithe, and so I've adjusted it. And I saw the adjustment in his offering. See, we put verse 24 up, please. <clears throat> Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. This verse is the antidote to the things that steal our worship. Do not bow down or do not worship. This, again, speaks of time and attention and prominence. What are the things that we're giving our time and our attention to? And be honest with yourself. One of the things I liked about those stats on cell phone use, it says when they survey people, most people had no idea how much time they were using. And so when they put them into an organized scientific study and then told them how much time it was, they were all stunned and they had no idea how much time it was. 2,617 times a day. But most people had no idea how much they were doing. And again, this is not legalism. This is not following rules and laws. I'm not up here saying, oh, your cell phone's bad. Don't touch it. I'm saying this is aligning our time and our attention on creator God Elohim. Verse 24 also says that we must demolish them. There is a place here to demolish what distracts us from worshiping God, wholeheartedly and exclusively. What might we need to demolish in our lives? For the Hebrews, it was idols, fetishes, and statues. It mentions their stone pieces here, which were stone statues. What idols or small g gods in our life do we need to demolish? And you, you got to start by asking yourself, what do I worship? What does my calendar and my checkbook show that I am worshiping? And then be honest about it. And we need to remember that those other gods we follow can't give us the same promises that God can. Remember, God can bless our food and water. He can take away sickness. He can prevent us from miscarrying. Your cell phone can't do that, Right? If you get sick, you could spend all night scrolling your cell phone for an answer to your sickness, yeah. or you can worship for 10 minutes. Yeah. One's going to have more effectiveness than the other. Yeah. Those other things that we're giving our time and attention to, they cannot bless our food, they cannot bless our water, they cannot take away sickness, they cannot prevent barrenness and miscarriages. Remembering and trusting in these promises it is what should motivate us to worship him exclusively and wholeheartedly. Again, I want to read the end of this verse. It says, The blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. I briefly talked about the blessing on the food and water. But in this context, God is asking them to remember the manna and the quail he caused to miraculously appear in Exodus 16. So as he is saying, I am creator God, and I want you to worship me exclusively, don't forget about the manna thing that I did. I made so much quail come, it was coming out of your nostrils, it says in the book. Yeah. That's a lot of quail. And God can still make food appear from nothing in our day. We've seen it. Yeah. Amy and I, have, especially when I was in the seminary, Amy and I would have food appear on our door. We would come home and there would just be food on our back porch. Now God used somebody, somebody came and put it there, but still, it was God making food appear for us. In this context, God is also asking them to remember the water that he made come from a rock in Exodus 17. 
So again, as God says, hey, remember that I'm creator God and I will bless your food, he's saying, don't forget about the man of the quail and the water that I made up here for you, right? This is the nature of creator God. And all he asks from us is wholehearted and exclusive worship. Our time, our attention, our tithe. And then the verse continues. It says, I will take away sickness from among you. See, these other nations as they were passing through were riddled with sickness and disease. If the people would only worship God, he would protect them from all that sickness. And hear this, God still does that today, right? Oftentimes when people come to me with chronic illness, I can quickly figure out that their life is full of lots of syncretism. And as we begin to sort through all the syncretism and the small g gods and we get rid of that stuff, lo and behold, they get better, they get well. Wholehearted and exclusive worship as we serve creator God, we will see healing in our bodies. It's a promise. And in the New Testament book of John, we learn that it is Jesus who created all things. So this is about worship of Jesus. Worship Jesus and only Jesus and you will find healing. It is a promise. We have seen people in this church spontaneously healed during worship. No one praying for them. One of the most powerful ones, there was a woman sitting right over here in this area one day. She had dislocated her shoulder. She came into church. She didn't tell anyone that she dislocated her. She just sat down for worship. And during worship, with no one praying for her, God completely healed her dislocated shoulder. Amen. After the service, she came up and she just told me about it. Amen. But I knew nothing of that before the service. So just being in worship, she got healed of a dislocated shoulder. This is the promise that God is explaining to us here in Exodus. <clears throat> Verse 26, and says, None will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you full lifespan. There is a promise here that none will be barren. barren. Well, having children was, of course, a sign of God's blessing. So God is restating the promise that he already gave them back in Genesis. But God is still doing this today. I want to share a story with you. Stephen, put up the picture of that woman. I was going to do this as a missions update, but it illustrates this point from Exodus here. This is an update from Pastor Omar in Senegal, one of the pastors that we support in Senegal. He sent me a bunch of pictures. I'm going to show you a couple here. It says, hello, Pastor. It is with immense joy that we would like to share with you what the Lord accomplished in the life of this lady named Tenning Senghor. So this lady's name is Tenning Senghor. She got married seven years ago, and during all this time, she could not have children. Last year, she learned about the gospel and decided to give her life to the Lord Jesus. Therefore, therefore, apart from being saved, the Lord responded to her greatest desire, which was to have a child. One year later, today, this was on September 18th, she gave birth to a pretty little girl, and her husband, who is a Muslim, is very happy. A subject of rejoicing for us all, because the name of Jesus will still be exalted, and his glory will be made known among men. Go to the next picture. Praise God. Here's the thing. The other gods that she used to follow couldn't do this. She accepted Jesus and she had a baby. Yep. So this passage in Exodus 23, God is still doing these things. Then the last part of verse 26 says, I will give you a full lifespan. The Hebrew is a little tricky, but it should be understood as this. The number of your days I will fulfill. Stephen, I think I have the YLT in there. There is not a miscarrying and a barren one in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. That's a very good rendering of the Hebrew. In other words, every day that God has determined for us will come to pass. But the implication is that if we don't worship him wholeheartedly and exclusively, some of our days may be stolen. Just like God didn't want the Israelites to get distracted by the gods of those other nations, God does not want us distracted by the temptations of small g gods in our day. What are we spending our time on? What are we worshiping? What does our calendar and our checkbook tell us about how our heart is aligned? What do we need to repent of? How do we need to adjust 
the way that we are living as a rule of life so that our life can be one of wholehearted and exclusive worship of Jesus. Yeah. Amen? Amen? All right, I will have us into communion. The worship team can get ready.